Hey everybody, welcome to episode 12 of Game Retail Rambling. I'm your host, Travis Severance, coming to you live from, we've moved directly from winter to construction season, Rochester, New York. Millennium Game Studios, home of the largest game store in North America. We've got a lot to talk about today, so I'm going to try to get into it as quick as I can. Appreciate the likes, the clicks, the subscribers. We're super, super close to 500, so if you're watching this or if you're seeing this on feedback, feel free to give me a like uh, on YouTube, that would be great. Two things we're going to talk about today, after our conversation with how to open a game store last week, that went really, really well. I want to briefly touch on the news that came out yesterday about Embracer Group and Asthma Day and all the the stuff that's happening, because I feel like I see a ton of conversation and and a ton of different takes and things like that. And I, you know, I, I, when things like this happen in the industry, I'm, I'm actually known for putting a a chicken little profile picture up because like the sky is really falling here. And I don't share some of the ideas and concerns that some of my peers that I've seen out there have. First and foremost, this is like, this is the first time in a number of years that Asmodee is actually going to be able to kind of, they're going to run their own thing for them. So they no longer have digital gaming or an investor hanging over the top of them. They're sort of going to make their own way. And a lot of people were really hung up with the, you know, the debt that they were assigned on the exit. And if you don't understand the way that some deals work and how that works as far as like just writing the ship for the rest of the stuff and you didn't dig into the financials and looked at, you know, headcount versus revenue and different things like that, the number probably looks pretty big and scary and that sort of thing. But my take on it is I'm, I have a, a handful of friends that are over there at Asmodee in different places. I've got a bunch of friends of mine in publishing that work with them on the outside too and handle the distribution tier. I'm encouraged by it. I think this is probably the best opportunity that they've had in a number of years. I think they can kind of get back to doing what they want to do. Um, you know, the, the, the things that they've had challenges with in my perspective over the last couple of years is, you know, it's, it's despite how good their marketing team is, it's really hard to market 5,000 SKUs. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of the publishers in the house that could, that could help lift a little bit there. I think there's a lot of pressure on the group proper to be able to try to, you know, pick your favorite baby at the moment to be able to put out in front of people. And I think that's really, really hard to do. And then the other thing I think they're a little bit weak on is projections. Their projections are pretty low. I think we see outages at times where it's either somebody doesn't have the the uh, the knowledge to be able to put in a good number or doesn't want to take on the risk. Uh, there's an old adage in the industry that says, you know, there's never been a salesperson fired for an empty warehouse, which is true. If it's a full warehouse and you've got a bunch of dead product and you're worried about where your inventory position is, Uh, that can be a real challenge. And I know, you know, they fell into the same trap that a bunch of other publishers did during the pandemic, which was just continue to print and continue to print. We're selling so much stuff. Why would this ever slow down? Well, it'd slow down as soon as the world turned back on. And then you find out you've got three years or seven years worth of ticket to ride sitting in a warehouse and it's just not selling like it was, or, you know, God forbid you're two years into uh, a supply on pandemic when nobody wants to talk about a pandemic. So I think overall, um, I, I'm not going to chicken a little about this. I'm kind of encouraged by it. The folks that I've talked to internally over there are, are pretty amped up about it. I think there's some um, things that they're still figuring out over there. But when I when I look at the assessment and, and there was some conversation that I was having at Gamma that was coming through about some of the changes to the board members and different things that were happening internally and the shifts that were going on with the, um, the fiefdom over there. And I think all those moves are fine. The fact that they retain Mark Nunez as, on the board um, is great. I know he's wanted to step back a couple of different times and they've sort of dragged him back in to write the ship and stuff. So with Mark being close by, I think that's that's good and Tomas is gonna do a great job. So if you're worried about Asmodee, you're concerned about Asmodee, they make a shitload of money. They know how to sell games. Projections are a little bit rough sometimes. Their distribution channel can be a little bit clunky, but overall they know how to make money and now they don't have the, the, the trappings that they've run into before in the back. So, you know, you may see over the course of the period of the next couple of years or next year or so, some of the publishing houses that they have being spun off themselves or them selling some assets or doing some some stuff like that. And they may do some acquisitions as well. But the benefit that I see them having is just that the amount of freedom that they have to control their own company now. Uh, so that's Asmodee in a nutshell for me. I think I did about five minutes on that. And today we're going to talk about Magic, which going from opening a game store to Magic is a, is a really nice transition in that... The majority of the game stores in the existence in the country right now are due to the fact that Magic the Gathering exists. There's no debating it. It's just a factual statement. There are more stores across the country that live and breathe off of Magic than they do anything else. There's more stores across the country that are singularly open to sell Magic cards and run Magic events. And there isn't another brand in the industry that can say that. Pokemon's obviously been strong for us. We've done really well with D&D. Uh, Games Workshop is another solid, solid license and solid brand for us. But the reality of it is, when I look at my books every year, 
your magic is usually somewhere is about 20% of what we do. There's some of my peers in the industry that are a little bit more focused on board games and, 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 and different things like that that would sort of turn their nose up on the reliance that, that we have on magic. But the reality of it is from the time that I started in this industry until now, magic's always been a really, really good investment. So if there was another brand in the industry that I could have started when it started and continued along that would have sustained a solid business model with growth involved in it, I don't know what it is because I don't think anything else by itself could sustain a successful store. Everything else kind of exists because of it. And what I mean by that is my magic story goes back to the summer of 1994. Best friends from high school came back from scout camp. They had starter decks for magic and we were a D&D group. We played a lot of D&D and they introduced me to magic. We started playing magic. I bought my first box of revised for $99 at B Dalton Books and the manager had to come and approve it because they'd never had anybody at the counter buy a full box. They were selling them by the pack and stuff, which was, a little strange, but yeah, I bought, I bought my first box of Revise and Open Revise and, you know, it was during a time period when packs were so limited that the place that I was buying it from, the, the local sci-fi shop, was two packs of Legends a day, one pack of Antiquities we could get a day, the Dark was limited as well, and the scarcity of product was, was pretty significant. Revise was pretty easy to find at the time, so that was sort of my journey with Magic. I played on up through Exodus and then I took a break and I didn't touch it. I, I went to college and... I missed a lot of the skill building sets in between and didn't really come back to Magic until Onslaught. And a lot of things had sort of changed in the Magic environment from the time that I left. Friday Night Magic had become a thing. It was something that I came in to play the first night of Onslaught. So I was trying to learn morph and figuring out what things were. And I had roommates at the time that were very successful Magic players that played on the Pro Tour and did well uh, in different high level events. And the, the store proper that I was involved in, the one that I bought, was super big into into magic in general. Uh, in fact, Rochester Draft was formed out of this store here. Magic has adjusted and gone through a whole bunch of different changes as it's gone along through the years. There's been different iterations of people that have been at the wheel of magic from time to time, whether it's design or development or how they're going to progress the game forward and what the sets are like. I mean, I, I, I lived through Fallen Empires and Homelands not being that great. And then finally Tempest came along and we were like, okay, now we're back to real magic here. And Tempest was a great set and that block was amazing and stuff. So when I came back and started working part-time, Onslaught was the first set that I sold out of this store. Uh, Morph was kind of an interesting mechanic, but Friday Night Magic was sort of the straw that stirred the drink. Our Friday Night Magic here was always draft. At the time, you could run draft or you could run standard. We ran draft here, and oftentimes when the store closed, we ran two or three drafts after that, or people went back to my house at the time, and we drafted for money most of the time. So when we draft, it was draft, replace the packs, and oftentimes it was $25 a head as well. So, you know, we would draft at the store, we'd take our pack winnings back to the apartment, and we'd, we'd draft again with guys that came down from Buffalo and Syracuse. So, you know, there was a really nice group. We'd 50, 60, sometimes 70 people playing in that in that space at the time. Um, so Magic was really firing. It was, a, it was a big deal. Before Magic got big, most of the game stores in the country, if you looked around, were like, Ah, oh, they had some kites, and they had some models, and they had some railroading stuff, and they maybe had some historical miniatures games or things like that, and maybe maybe they had a book section, or they were a book section that also happened to carry some magic and things like that. There were game stores that existed back then, but board games sort of hadn't crossed the threshold either, although Catan had started to pick up in popularity and some of the Euro stuff started to come, but you know, we were sort of like the game store was gate kept by, you know, Hasbro and Mattel only selling to big box stores, not really selling to mom and pop and that sort of thing. So magic sort of opened up a different revenue stream that that game stores had. And all of a sudden we could start carrying and leaning into all these different brands. And there was capital that that hobby retailers ended up having. It opened the doors to a whole bunch of things. It, it obviously is the it's magic is the parent of all 57 million different TCGs that have come down the pipe since then. It's responsible for the birth of all of them, right? It was the first one to ever do it. And that's the reason why we have the number of card games that we have today. And the number of card games have, has ebbed and flowed uh, as far as the number of them in the market. We're, we're in a high point right now. There was a time, you know, a couple of years ago when there were significantly less and a time before that there were significantly less. In the 90s, they were just exploding all over the place. We had tons and tons and tons and tons of card games that were coming out all the time. It just, you couldn't possibly keep up with it. My manager, Jim, is the person that's played the most TCGs I've ever known. He's like well over 100 TCGs that he's ever bought into in his life. Huge fan of TCGs. I'm a huge fan of TCGs. I've been playing card games for the majority of my hobby career, even though I was a role player first, really. Card games are nice because they're super simple and portable and you can take them anywhere with you. So a bunch of changes happened. Uh, the game was sort of on a downswing around Kamigawa and then Kamigawa to Ravnica and it floundered a little bit and things were getting a little bit slow. That was soft. And then all of a sudden, 
in Lorwyn, out came Planeswalkers. And at the time when Planeswalkers came out, it felt like it was a real renaissance for the game. There was a nuke subtype for a card type uh, that was needed. All of a sudden we had these Planeswalkers that we cared about. They were pretty strong. The initial ones were uh, in each of the different colors. They were relatable. Um, now all of a sudden you had a, you had characters in a story that you were telling before where there was a story that was going on and the characters were there, but like it didn't feel like you really had them on your side of the board for that much and so on and so forth. So the, the advent of Planeswalkers came out in, in Lorwyn and it was super, it popped the game a lot. Magic Online started to pick up a lot at that point. There were a whole bunch of things that happened to the game in general that sort of set it on this new trajectory. It had gotten slow and then it got hot again. Um, so Magic was pretty hot from Lorwyn forward. All sorts of things started to shift around with the company as well. So for a long period of time, what would happen is there were these tournament organizers that owned controls of different areas in the country and they were divided up and Wizards divided them up based on the, uh, you know maybe a dozen different people across the country. And they got to decide who ran pre-releases and who didn't. And eventually uh, it got to the point where they decided to change gears on that and everybody got to run pre-releases. So it was a more even playing field at that point. Magic saw another growth during that period of time as well. Uh, all of a sudden your local store could run, could run those events and there were some parameters that we had to follow and things like that. But it wasn't like there was just two people in your state or two people in your region that were allowed to run them. They were the one that got hundreds and hundreds of customers that came in and, and generated hundreds of thousands of dollars off of that as well. So those adjustments was another time when the magic when magic grew. The other time that magic grew a whole lot as far as like people playing in store and that sort of thing is much to my chagrin in January 2015, WPN announced that Friday Night Magic now, instead of being a situation where you had to play standard or you had to draft, you could play any format you wanted. My concern for FNM at that point was based on um, a lot of our attendance was based on college students. So we're, we're fairly close to uh, a number of colleges and a lot of people are like, well, you know, colleges have a whole bunch of gamers. That must be a huge boon for your, for your business. And, and it, and it is from a tournament standpoint, but a lot of college students actually don't have a ton of money. We've got RIT, we've got U of R, we've got St. John Fisher, we've got a handful of different colleges in the area. College students are pretty strapped for cash, so it's not like they're these big giant spenders or anything like that, but they certainly like their entertainment. You know, we, we sell micro entertainment and stuff. We have a whole bunch of games that they enjoy playing. So, you know, when college is in session, our events are our events are killing it. Like we do really, really well. And part of my concern with that is the, the part about Friday Night Magic that I enjoyed the most was just the consistency to it. I knew that if I was traveling or if I was headed to Chicago, or if I was going to Florida for a trip or something like that, and you know, I had my Friday night free, I would be able to go to a local store. And if I brought my standard deck with me, I could play standard or I could draft depending on what they were doing. And I was good to go, throw that in my carry on bag and I could show up. But you know, when they changed everything, it was like, oh, well, what are you playing? Well, it's popper here and it's commander here and it's extended here and it's only blue cards here. Like you could literally do whatever you wanted. Now there was a huge, based on what I talked to with some of the wizards employees, there was a huge influx of the number of people that were attending Friday Night Magic at that point. A bunch of stores were running things differently and it also offered the, it did offer the opportunity for different stores in different areas that weren't willing to, at the time, Friday Night Magic had sort of devolved into a bunch of stores in the country basically paying to have the customers there. So they'd, they'd give out boxes and they'd give out cases of product for a very low entry point with the idea that there's so many people in the store that they're gonna trade in cards so that they can generate revenue off the singles and that was the way that they were making their money. They weren't making their money on entry fees. So when Wizards decided to go in and open the open the floodgates to let you run whatever you want, it gave other stores in the area this ability to be able to compete, not just on specific formats, but they could offer a different sort of style of event. Despite the inconsistency, there was this opportunity for people to run different things and to be able to have their own meta and have their own stuff and make the make the format more casual and things like that. And in different areas that were competitive, it did allow you to stand out as a store in a way that at the time when the announcement came out, I certainly didn't realize or recognize. We haven't adjusted ours. We, we do draft and we do standard and that's what we do. Um, the consistency part of it is super important to us. We offer a ton of different formats on we play magic every night of the week. There is a there is a magic event on our event calendar every night of the week. The format is different. Sometimes there's two events. Sometimes there's three events. It really depends. So if you you take a look at our event calendar, uh, magic gets the number of spaces that it does because of the number of the the number of sales that it generates. So our event space, as I've said before in other episodes, is the space that we lay out and the amount of work that we put into running events is based on what that brand sells in revenue. Well, Magic 
and Magic Singles sells more than any other category that we have in the store. Magic Sealed is really close to what I sell in board games. Nothing else even comes, comes close to what Magic does, and that's the reason why there's so much attention on Magic. At one point, Chris Cox from Microsoft got hired to, to run Wizards of the Coast, and um, my concern with that was that uh, their, their digital app, Magic Online, was fairly clunky at the time. I was fairly confident that he was going to come in and uh, digitize the game, and sure enough, he did. Uh, Arena came out and debuted, and it was a it, it is a beautiful app for playing the game. It's really easy to get a game. The prices on it are in line with the rest of the digital card game products, uh, even though that's not in line with what the paper products are that I'm trying to sell. It's super easy to play a game. You can sit home in your boxer shorts and not have to leave and drink your own coffee and not have to shuffle your deck. and off you go in the digital space. So the app was fantastic. And during the pandemic, uh, Magic saved Hasbro. There's no, there's no better way to say it. The revenue that was generated from Magic during that period of time was done so in a way where if Magic wasn't part of the Hasbro catalog, Hasbro would have been defunct. Now, back in the day when Hasbro originally took over uh, Wizards of the Coast and stuff, they gave the person that was running Watsi at the time was was given the title Gaming Czar, which is sort of like a laughable thing to be called and, 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 and a little bit derogatory if you look at the way that corporate structures are and stuff. And, and, and now you've got Chris Cox that comes in and he has uh, escalated. He's, he's, he's grown to the point where he's, he's, he's on the top of Hasbro now. So we moved from Watsi to the top of Hasbro. And with that came a whole bunch of pressure uh, from investors and shareholders and, and a bunch of people to continue this insane amount of growth that Magic saw during the pandemic when we were all trapped inside of our houses and looking for you know, any form of micro entertainment that we could with a whole bunch of free money coming in from the government and PPP loans and different things like that. And when you get into that position, there's a lot of pressure that comes down from the board of directors and a lot of pressure from shareholders to continue to maintain that growth. The growth that Magic saw in the pandemic is just not something that's realistic. You you can't see that sort of a jump for a product line ever unless you have you invent the cure for cancer. Like it was wild how much of a difference uh, they made and the portfolio saved them. So he got moved into that position. And what we've dealt with over the course of the years was a lot of strategic changes um, and a lot of uh, leaning on Magic as a brand to sort of bail out the the stuff that we see at Hasbro. So Hasbro is mainly focused on analog play with you know some digital stuff, but mostly analog play and, and, and toys and that sort of thing. And younger generations are going away from toys. Most of the toys that I sell, believe it or not, in here are for, sold to 20 something year olds. It's not sold to younger kids because they just don't play with toys the way that they do. They've got iPads and they've got Apple products and different things like that that they're playing in the digital space. With Magic doing its thing, a decision was made that if you take a look at, and we'll throw up a slide at some point during this in the cut on YouTube, that's about the number of SKUs that were increased to, to sort of make up the difference in what they were going to sell from year to year. So when it started to slow down, the first decision that was made was we're going to cram the pipeline full of 28% more SKUs from year over year. So if you look at the sheer volume of releases and the number of SKUs that were, that were pushed into the marketplace at that time, it was pretty significant. They were all over the place. Secret Lair was this huge thing that was a direct-to-consumer initiative that they were doing in the middle of that that was cranking for them. They they shoved all these different product types in. Now we've got sets that are releasing with theme boosters and they're, they're releasing with, um, you know, we've got different types of booster products for every single set. So now we've got Jumpstart in here and we've got collector's boosters and all these other things that sort of make up a whole bunch of buying decisions that we had to make on a, on a retail scale and that the consumers had to make as well. And that year went okay for them. But you can't sort of go back to the same thing uh, and have people drink from a fire hose. So instead of increasing the product load for us another 28 or 30% like they did the previous year, they tuned up the cost for us. So now <laughs> Magic goes away from MSRP in February 2019 and decides, okay, we're not gonna have any MSRP attached to our product because we don't wanna sell booster packs for $5 or whatever their decision was to decide to do that, which any of the retailers or publishers that, that use or understand how Amazon works, they have a giant presence on Amazon. So whether they say there's an MSRP or not, if you go to their, their entire portion of Amazon, there's listed pricing there that's from their store. Whether they want to call it an MSRP or not, that's the, that's the price that's the price. Now the market's set by TCG Player, but their MSRP is set based on what they put on Amazon and Amazon algorithms based on what the selling is. So if you take a look now and you were to compare the pricing for boxes of Thunder Gulch on Amazon with TCG Player, they're within a couple of bucks based on what the what the product is. So when the MSRP was removed, what they did during that period of time, they removed the MSRP because they jacked our pricing. 
So our pricing on product went up 20%, 20%, 25%, depending on which type of product it was, uh, in an effort to continue to sustain the same amount of revenue that they were getting from the, from the game, even though we were at a point where we were drinking out of a fire hose with the number of releases. There was a, a, an element of confusion that came into play as well because there were now products that we were selling regularly that couldn't be used in standard that were only built for modern or they were built for legacy. Um, there were there were decisions that were made during that that sort of changed the product mix as well. And in the middle of this, what had happened was Commander got super, super popular. All of a sudden, standard sort of dwindled down and, and modern was in a growth and Pioneer sort of was getting its legs underneath itself, but Commander came out of nowhere. Now, all of a sudden, we had Commander decks that were part of what we were selling. So we we're in really good shape as far as being able to approach uh, casuals with this single buy this deck you've got a hundred cards in it you've got one of each card uh go and have a good time the the challenge with commander is this it's not an easy way to learn the game if you're onboarding somebody into magic with a starter deck that's maybe a 40 card or a 50 card starter deck some of the ease of entry is that there's four of each of the cards so there's some repetition in there and decision making in there and you figure out how to how to cast the spells you need to spell, need to cast, and what creatures you need to play, and sort of the cadence of what a turn looks like. And you're not negotiating the politics of a 2v2 or a 1v1v1v1 commander deck, where you may play 20 games and not see 20 of the different cards in your deck because there's only one of them. Commander, for as much as it's done for the casual magic player and the ability to be able to bring people in because it's, it's an easy one-time purchase and you've got a whole bunch of different options and the, the it's not a solved meta it is a really difficult format to sort of get into this game for because you don't know what cards you're going to see you're going to have to learn you know it's 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 trial by fire you're going to have to shovel up this giant deck of cards and you're going to play and if you're playing you know it, at a four person table there's politics that you're going to have to learn on top of the rules of the game and stuff like that so it's actually pretty amazing the fact that commander is still doing what it's doing and still is our main recruitment tool for magic given the actual how difficult the game is to actually play that way as far as learning the game and learning the cards because the standard format learning the cards and the meta for that takes a little while but really it's going to boil down to you know in the best of times maybe six to eight decks with some sideboard cards but you're going to see a lot of the different a lot of the same decks and you're going to play through a lot of the same games and you'll understand the game with commander it's it's the literal wild west pun intended because of outlaws of thunder junction a lot of changes so so wizards wizards has done a lot of changes i mean their ceo just left um she put in her notice she's done i think in three days based on what the report was that i saw 1900 individuals that were let go from hasbro a lot of people were shocked that those people came from the, the magic side and they came from the D&D side because those two areas were profitable. So why would you get rid of a whole bunch of people from that side? I'll, I'll speculate and I'll say that the D&D team didn't do themselves any favors with how they managed the OGL situation and that leak happening. On the magic side of things, I think that was more political adjustments and sort of flattening things down. Like they're at a spot now where costs are what costs are. They need to make a certain amount of revenue to um make the board and make the investors happy if i look around at the executive team that's there internally there isn't really anybody to replace chris anymore they'd have to bring somebody in from the outside to take over that spot so with the people that exited of the 1900 before and the current ceo stepping down in three days it would be really challenging for hasbro to find somebody to replace chris so from a gamesmanship standpoint good move so i'm going to go into seven issues with magic the gathering for me feel free to disagree with any of these you like in the comments i'm sure there's going to be plenty of people that uh, have different feelings about that. I know this is a polarizing subject. This is just the way that I deal with magic and some adjustments that I would be okay if they decided to make at some point. So number seven is stop running promotions for my retail store that gives players rewards on arena. I was forced to run events that we run that are uh, authorized events that are specific events that are that are made for a certain reason through our system. And I had to give out gems for arena. I don't want to do that. I don't want to promote the Arena app. The Arena app's lovely. Those people that want to play in that space go ahead. I don't need the vice versa of it either. You don't need to promote my stuff on the Arena app either. Let's just have those be separate things. Digital cards are like 30% cheaper than what paper cards are. And it's a it's just a space that I don't need to promote on my side of it. And me having to promote that without any sort of geocaching or some kind of a revenue share that I'm getting based on the number of players that are there or WPN players that are associated with my store or something like that. Like I, I don't want to promote for your digital app anymore. 
Number six, and I touched on this earlier, uh, Commander is a really hard format to learn magic. It's nice that there's uh, starter decks that have come along. I appreciate this. One of the comments that I can make about magic at times is sometimes they end up going too long on certain things. And what I mean by that is Planeswalker decks worked until they didn't work. Starter decks worked until they didn't work. They decided they were going to do Jumpstart for every set for like six sets in a row because Jumpstart was super popular. I understand the want and the desire to do that, but just strategically inserting them at certain points makes sense. If you want to do the starter decks in line with your universes beyond stuff, that's great. Go for that. I think that there's a lot of intelligence to that because you're going to have a bunch of people coming into the game that are maybe more familiar with the license than the game itself. So let's let's kind of focus there. Number five, standard's dead in my store because of the price differences and the easy use between paper versus arena. Arena's super easy to get on, it's super easy to get games. It's, it, there's no reason for you to step outside and do that. And, and the value of most standard cards is still reflective of only the commander set. Uh, so the commander cards are the most important there. There are occasionally some cards that need to be used in other formats, but in general, the majority of the commander cards that we sell, we sell because they're, the, the majority of the standard cards that we sell, we sell because they're commander card playable. Uh, number four, please stop dumping product on Amazon. Um, I can go back to all the different instances where that's happened, but every time that happens, us as retailers are already struggling to sell product that's not worth anything. You dumping it on Amazon makes it that much harder for me to try to sell that and get out from underneath it and I'm stuck with it as well. So please stop doing that. Number three, the number of SKUs per year is untenable by a player in a store at this point. I'd really like somebody there to take a look at the things that are going on internally and how many SKUs you're releasing and, and decide if if actually that many of them need to be made or we can pull back a little bit. I'm, I'm happy with the shift to the play boosters. The downside to the play boosters are they've made standard more expensive now. And one of the problems with standard was the cost to draft in store versus the cost to draft online. So play boosters definitely has not helped that out. The other thing too is when it comes to the number of SKUs, like we have to place our orders with distribution before we know what the gimmicks of the set are. Like with this OTJ set, there were two subsets that distribution didn't know about when they had to order and we didn't know about and barely knew about when we had to place our orders by. So knowing more about what the set is makes it easier for us to make a buying decision. You know, a as an example, <laughs> most of the OTJ stock was out by the time we tried to order it for, for actual release because everybody had bumped their numbers up for pre-release because the more of the set was spoiled, so the set was going to be better. And what that meant was that I couldn't order anything on release date for release from my distributors the week of release. That's, there's, there's a problem with the supply chain there. Uh, number two is gonna be confusion in the marketplace for products and formats. The customers come in, they take a look at the stuff on the shelf. They don't understand why they can't play their Lord of the Rings stuff in a standard format if they wanted to play. They don't understand why the mixing is in there. There's no real trade dress that tells them that either. There's no way for them to figure out or understand why they can't do certain things. And what happens is when Part of the reason why Standard is in such a rough shape is players get onboarded into the game in Commander, they have favorite cards they like to play in Commander, and then they go to look at Standard and they can't play those cards in Standard. Why would they decide to dabble in Standard? Even with you increasing Standard from two-year rotation to three-year rotation, the amount of time that a card sits in the Standard format, if it's not something that Commander players can play regularly in that format, then they're not interested in transitioning over to that format. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and the number one challenge that I have with Magic and we're we're going to see a little bit of this when Modern Horizons 3 comes out because we're talking about $500 boxes, is the price of Magic's too high. If you look around and you look at the competition in the marketplace and how many people are there and what's going on, the, the, the average cost of a Magic product is significantly higher than it was just a couple of years ago. It makes Paper Magic a lot harder to sell. If the prices continue to increase this way, it's, it's just going to create further and further uh, parity between the you and the rest of the card games in the industry. The card games in the industry are cranking right now. Uh, honorable mention, I think, will be uh, strip mining any value from previous sets to hurry up and put them into whatever your compilation sets are. Going back through and reprinting all the expensive cards from you know the most recent sets and pushing them forward in a master set or a horizon set or something of that effect means that anybody that loaded up on those boxes before just aren't gonna they're never gonna see the value there and maybe it's supposed to be just so that we order just in time stuff and we're not investing in magic give the give those recent cards a little bit of time to grow so that they can get out there and do its thing all that's to say overall this year despite the complaints that i have and the concerns and the issues then the adjustments that i wish they would make uh, our magic sales are up 21 percent 
Uh, old sets are starting to sell. There's a rebound for the sealed product. Things are things are happening there. I can't put my finger on exactly why. Karlov Manor was a nightmare. I, Karlov Manor felt like I felt in October of last year when I was just liquidating every magic box because everything was going into the toilet. Thunder Junction comes out and Thunder Junction's really popular. And we'll see with Assassin's Creed. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Bloomboro. Uh, it's the first uh, new uh, area that they've gone into that I've been really excited about since like Shadowmore. The art has really got me popped. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that Magic is doing to sort of make things more attractive to a broader audience. It's the first set that I look at that really I think is 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 going to allow itself to open up. The cuteness of it is going to open itself up broadly to a giant market of people and players. It looks really fun, so I'm hopeful for that. Uh, we'll see what happens in the middle of that. Modern Horizons 3, hopefully the set is really, really good because it's really, really expensive. That's it for today. Uh, next week's going to be right around May the 4th, so we're going to focus the show all about Star Wars, and I'm going to talk about all the things that I have on my shelf right now that Star Wars related or Star Wars adjacent, and we'll focus on that completely. Obviously, we'll go into an AMA after this. It looks like we've got about 24 minutes. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by. Please click subscribe if you haven't on my YouTube. Thanks.